It's another race day at Talladega Super Speedway, and the buzz is considerable. After the race in Martinsville, Kyle had some thoughts while the drivers prepared for the next race. At the Talladega, Bush did no other talk except his run-in last week at Martinsville with Corey LaJoy. Kyle Busch doesn't hold back, first attacking Corey LaJoy and then blaming NASCAR for not punishing the Spire Motorsports driver for his words this week. So what is going on between the drivers? Are the stakes the highest they've ever been? And why is Kyle Busch making things difficult for other NASCAR drivers? Stay tuned to NASCAR Zone to find out. But before we dive into that, do subscribe to our channel and hit the like button. Last weekend, Kyle Busch had a hard time at Martinsville Speedway and finished 21st. The most memorable part of the Richard Childress Racing Drivers' Day was when he and Corey LaJoy fought. This weekend at Talladega, the two-time winner talked about his run-in with the Spire Motorsports driver last week. He didn't have anything good to say about his fellow racer. That wasn't all, though. The future Hall of Famer also said that the driver of the number 7 car should have been punished for something he said this week. Kyle Busch spoke with the media on Saturday at Talladega, the same spot where he first acknowledged there were problems at Joe Gibbs racing a year ago. This weekend, he met with the media and didn't talk about free agency. Instead, he talked about his run-in with Corey LaJoy last week at Martinsville. It's Corey LaJoy's reputation within the garage? I don't know. Ask everybody else. As far as him with me, um, he's been a pain in the dick to, to race with and pass for years, just coming up and lapping him and things like that. Every time I'm around him, it's like he tries an extra 20% harder to make sure I stay behind him, but it's just not fun. But, um, you know, that's it. Is that, is that him just trying to prove himself and like trying to make a name for himself? Or is that just his eye style? Or? I don't know. I don't know what that, I don't know what that gets you. What was the contact with, between you two last week? Or how did that start? Just that. He was fading. I was not that great, and but I was just that much better than he was, and he was running the top lane, which was my lane. I tried to go to the bottom a couple times, and my car would not run the bottom. I could not accelerate out of the turns without getting loose, and I kept getting loose and just barely nudging him and touching him a little bit um, coming out of the corners. And then, um, you know, he, he slammed down into me uh, down the front stretch and admitted it on his podcast that he wanted to crash me and create a yellow and didn't get penalized, even though Denny Hamlin did. So again, our inconsistency of consistency is, uh, or the other way around is, is yeah, is, is impeccable. So um, just, yeah. Bush was referring to the fact that LaJoy had talked about the rough racing with the RCR driver on his stacking pennies show earlier this week and admitted that he was trying to wreck the number eight car to get a yellow flag. The, the, underlying motive for everybody and that's kind of what got my frustration with Kyle Busch when we started door smashing each other you get in those positions where if you're needing a yellow and you're needing a pit you're looking to wreck somebody that's what you get because you can't afford to come down pit road and get stuck by a caution so when Kyle Busch I'm bleeding I went from like 15th to 19th 20th my rear tires are blown off of it Kyle's going backwards too so he was frustrated but he drove into my left rear three different times off the corner, boom, like looking to cut my tire down. Maybe he wasn't, but when you, after three times. Like he consist, turned underneath you? Yeah. And then he kind of couldn't keep, couldn't keep driving and kind of bounced Just off of you? Kept driving the left rear tire. I'm like, okay, buddy. One's okay. Two, all right, dude. I'm sorry. Like three, okay, mother. Come off four the next time. And he dro drove in there again four times. It was like over the span of like six laps, just driving it. So he gets to my door and I just yank a left. Like, here's the thing. Don't drive it in my left rear and try to cut it down. Now, fans and NASCAR officials will be watching the numbers seven and eight cars when they get close to each other because things could get interesting. What do you think about how both the drivers are going to deal with things with each other? Let us know in the comments section below. Be sure to hit the bell button and subscribe to our channel to get the latest updates. After the win at the Talladega Super Speedway, it seems like Kyle Busch has made things difficult for other NASCAR drivers. But how? One of the things that makes super speedway races interesting is that any driver who starts the race has a better than average chance of winning it and getting into the NASCAR playoffs. However, those prospects have greatly decreased as a result of a couple of victories by future Hall of Famers in two of the first three races of the season that were held on super speedways. Ricky Stenhouse Jr., 
who has been a full-time Cup Series driver for the past 10 years, scored an unexpected victory at the Daytona 500, which has put him in a position to qualify for the past season for just the second time in his career. Austin Sindrick, Ross Chastain, and Austin Dillon all won regular season super speedway races a year ago, so his win came after those three. Chastain had already won his first race of the season and first in the Cup Series at the Circuit of the Americas, a month before his win at Talladega Super Speedway. However, Sindrick and Dillon's wins at Daytona International Speedway were the only reason those two drivers made it into the playoffs. They were also part of a record 16 different drivers who won a race during the 26 race regular season in the inaugural year of NASCAR's new next-gen vehicle model, which requires all teams to acquire their parts from a single supplier. These restrictions are still in existence, but the larger teams have started to pull away from the rest of the competition. After a season in which most teams finished with the same record in 2022, large teams are once again consistently victorious. Hendrick Motorsports, for example, has won four of the first 10 races, and three of its four drivers are now in a position to make the playoffs. This is the case despite the fact that William Byron and Alex Bowman have been penalized 60 points each for their team's improper modifications to the greenhouse area of the numbers 24 and 48 vehicles. Chase Elliott missed six races because his leg was broken. Smaller teams, such as Stenhouse's one-car GTG Doherty outfit, will have fewer and fewer chances to compete this season if the conventional powerhouse organizations are going to be in front of the pack more frequently than in previous seasons. For teams like Front Row Motorsports, Legacy Motor Club, Wood Brothers Racing, and Spire Motorsports, participation in races held on super speedways is most likely their only chance to advance to the postseason. Even drivers competing for huge teams, like Eric Almarola and Bubba Wallace of Stuart Haas Racing and 2311 Racing, frequently rely on their super speedway prowess to cover for weaknesses in other aspects of their seasons. Now that Joey Logano and Kyle Busch have won the first two races after Daytona that were held on super speedways, these chances are even less likely. At the Atlanta Motor Speedway in March, Logano prevailed over Brad Keselowski to take first place. And at the Talladega Super Speedway on Sunday, Kyle Busch emerged triumphant despite just avoiding an accident in the final lap. Logano and Busch have won a total of 93 races and four Cup Series titles. Taking this one step further, they have a combined total of 291 victories across all three national series that NASCAR offers. When Bush and the rest of the Cup Series arrived at Auto Club Speedway in February, he had already claimed victory in the second race of the season. Despite the fact that Logano was tied for 11th in the point standings at the time of his win at Atlanta, his track record of nine playoff berths in the prior 10 seasons suggested that he would have little difficulty gaining hold of one of the 16 postseason spots. The 2023 regular season will conclude with just two more races in the Super Speedway format. The Cup Series will race again at Atlanta on July 9, and the last race of the normal season will be held at Daytona on August 26. Given how strong the biggest teams have been so far this season, many drivers will be even more desperate to get their first win. These factors could result in a pair of action-packed races at Atlanta and Daytona, but they also have the potential to make Stenhouse the lone unexpected driver to advance to the playoffs and make the last stretch of the regular season much more predictable. If you're worried that super speedway racing has become too unpredictable because Michael McDowell, Austin Sindrick, and Rick Stenhouse have won the last three Daytona 500s, remember that William Byron, Chase Elliott, Logano, and Kurt Busch have also won five super speedway races in the past two seasons. The drivers that finish at the front of the field on a consistent basis at tracks that are not super speedway circuits have also enjoyed a great deal of success when competing on super speedway circuits, and this success may be attributed either to luck or to skill. So that is for today. Hope you enjoy it. Tell us in the comments what you think about the video, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to see more of our videos on NASCAR updates. Look forward to seeing you in the next video.